Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Romina Ichon, COO, and with me as always is Tim Anaya, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. How are you, Tim? I'm great. How are you? Fine, thank you. So we've got another longer podcast this time, so we're going to try to keep this one short. Uh, so Tim, I'm just going to hand it right over to you. Uh, you've been following the uh, legislature, and this is the last month of their session, and especially now that we've got we've got a new speaker. So Tim, what can we expect? Well, I I think that's the big question, right? Is that normally you kind of know how these things are going to play out and kind of the bill outcomes are pretty much preordained minus one or two. Um, but now things are very different with Speaker Robert Rivas. And it's pretty clear that things are going to be more top down than committee chairs kind of deciding on their own what they want to do, regardless of whether, uh, you know, the rest of Assembly Democrats want to go in that direction. So I think there's there's three key bills where we're going to see how do things go differently with a Robert Rivas as speaker. Number one, we've already kind of seen before the summer recess, and that's the bill by Senator Shannon Grove to put more penalties for uh, human trafficking in California. Of course, that was a big brouhaha um, when the Assembly Public Safety Committee didn't pass that bill, despite it getting a unanimous vote in the state Senate, and Speaker Rivas had to intervene to ensure the bill passed committee. Now, what's going to happen with that bill now? You know, I, I would assume that the bill is going to go through and get to the governor's desk and the governor says he would sign the bill. Um, what's going to happen there? And are there going to be other changes made to the public safety committee? Is there going to be a new chair sometime soon? So I think that's an interesting one to watch. The other one are all of these various housing reform bills and the ongoing um, years-long um, package of bills being pushed by Senator Scott Weiner to make it easier to build more badly needed housing in California. You know, the usual interests are lined up on both sides of those bills. Speaker Rivas publicly stated he supports the key bills this year. So what's going to happen there? You know, is he going to give those bills a lift to get them through to the governor's desk? You know, those will be interesting to watch as well. And then the final one, which is one that we're paying attention to here at PRI, is Senator Weiner's kind of stepping stone bill, as our Sally Pipes has christened it, to single-payer health care. It hasn't gotten the attention and it hasn't been the subject of the significant debates that the prior single-payer bills have gotten. So ultimately, what's Speaker Rivas going to do on this one? Does he want to see that go to the governor's desk? And then how will he handle next year? Uh, Assemblyman Ash Calra has promised he's going to bring back his bigger, more traditional single-payer bill. What is Rivas going to do on that when that starts to percolate through the legislature? So those are three kind of interesting issues to watch in this end of session period. Great. Thanks so much, Tim. So let's jump into the podcast. So our, our guest this week is, is John Yu. He's a law professor at UC Berkeley, and many of you know, probably know him uh, as a Fox News contributor on Supreme on the Supreme Court and other legal matters. Uh, going back further, he's the Bush Ad Justice Department official who wrote the waterboarding memos as, as Deputy Assistant Attorney General. So this is a recording of his his luncheon talk on his new book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court, part of the Regnery uh, publishing firm's um, guide on um, politically incorrect uh, issues, politically incorrect guides. Uh, and we affectionately call them the pig series. So you probably have some on your library. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting talk. So please enjoy. John Yu. I was asked to write this book by Regnery uh, as part of its politically incorrect guide. I said, who's the market? Who are the readers? So actually, when I write anything for anybody, I usually say, who is the ideal reader? So just as to let you know, when I write for the Wall Street Journal, they told me, uh, the, our, our reader, we expect to have about the knowledge base background of a freshman in college, right? For, as if you're writing for a freshman in college. Believe it or not, occasionally I write for the New York Times. And I said, who, what is the average readers intelligence that you want me to write for I, I this is not a joke the editor said eighth grade when i asked regnery who should I, so they said imagine you're writing this for grandparents and parents who want to buy a book and give it to their kid and say this is what you're not learning in school so that's how i started writing the book but after last year's term at the supreme court i i'm afraid it turned more into a defense of the supreme court as an institution because as you can see right now we're living through a period of attack on the Supreme Court that we have not seen probably 
in several generations, since at least the time of FDR's effort to pack the court in response to the court's resistance to the New Deal. Uh, you know, you've seen these stories about uh, Justice Thomas, I clicked for Justice Thomas, attacks on Samuel Alito, attacks on Neil Gorsuch uh, for ethics and financial, claims of financial improprieties and leading to legislation that's being proposed in Congress to govern the ethics of the justices, to allow people to demand their recusal from cases, not just parties before the court, but anybody would now under this legislation be allowed to complain about any justice sitting on any case and trigger an investigation by lower court judges who are the ones whose decisions are being overruled by the Supreme Court. Right? I talk about conflict of interest. Um, this comes on the heels of a serious push to pack the court. This has become, I don't know if you remember this, but during the uh, primary election in 2016 on the Democratic side, at one of the very first debates, uh, one of the moderators said, raise your hand if you're in favor of expanding the size of the Supreme Court. The only nominee who didn't raise their hand actually happened to be Joe Biden. Every other single nominee in 2016 for the Democratic Party raised their hand and said they were in favor of expanding the size of the Supreme Court in order to change its direction. And Joe Biden, actually, he, I'm not sure if this was his idea or whose idea, but he actually ended foisting off the whole problem to a commission. And this commission recommended against it. But I have no doubt if there's a second term and Democrats take the House and keep the Senate, that you will see a very strong push to try to expand the size of the Supreme Court again. Something uh, that used to be off limits for our, our politics. We have really never engaged in the practice of manipulating the size and number of the Supreme Court because of disagreement with its decisions. But I think we're at the precipice of crossing uh, that line. But what I want to do is explain what the court was doing. And that's not simply a matter of politics, that the court did not reverse Roe versus Wade because there's a lot of justices who have a particular view about abortion. Uh, or that the court uh, in the Bruin case about the Second Amendment voted a certain way just because some of them might like to have a gun. Or that we're seeing a big change in what we call the administrative state where the court has been saying, we're going to start trying to you know, scale back the size of, I think maybe the most powerful branch of government has become the administrative state. It's not because they have any particular love or hate for what the EPA is doing in environmental issues, but because of a deeper, and all these, they have a deeper ideological position on the proper role of government, the proper size of government, and the proper relationship between the branches. Uh, two other points just to observe is, uh, you could see last year and this year, uh, argue in the book, as the culmination of what we call the conservative legal movement. Uh, this is a movement that really was started with uh, people like Robert Bork and Antonin Scalia. Think about this. The two decisions that the conservative legal movement formed around to try to overturn took 50 years to overturn. The two decisions that were the poster child for the conservative legal movement were Roe versus Wade, decided in 1973, not overruled till 2022. And the other one was Backey, right? The idea that the government could use race, right? That's decision 1978, 79, again, almost 50 years of persistent conservative criticism. And not just critic uh, conservative, there were a lot of liberals who were very critical about Roe versus Wade when it came out. There are a lot of liberals who are very critical of Backey. Uh, I, I have to say, uh, 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 Governor Wilson knows some of these characters. <laughs> Several of the deans at the Berkeley Law School, who are close friends of mine, violently disagreed with Backey. But as officials of the university, they had to uphold it. But they were strong critics of the idea that the government should use race to allocate college admission, college seats. But think about it, it was a 50-year campaign by conservatives to try to overrule Roe, to try to overrule Backey. Look how long it took 
multiple setbacks over the years. Multiple justices appointed by Republican presidents who ended up voting to uphold Roe or uphold Bakke over the years. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it, this last two years, this maybe, maybe it's hard to get a sense of, it is the culmination of a half century of conservatives working in politics, working in law to try to change, I think were deeply flawed decisions. So one other thing about the book uh, at the end is to ask, well, where do we go from here? Because in a way, the conservative legal movement, and I think conservative politics generally, we're fighting about what's the future direction. Because uh, in a way, we have achieved what the conservative legal movement set out to do 50 some years ago. And so at the end of the book, we try to figure out what is the this new Roberts Court with the three Trump justices going to want to change in the future. I think one of them is to expand the rights of religious minorities and the rights of and to protect more deeply the rights of free speech. This is in fact something that uh, crosses ideological uh, lines. Sometimes the three liberal justices, uh, Kagan, Sotomayor, we'll see about uh, Jackson, <laughs> but at least Sotomayor and Kagan sometimes vote with the uh, more conservative justices when it comes to speech and religion issues. The other issue I think would be, uh, I think, uh, be deeply meaningful in Orange County, because if you think about it, the great uh, political movement to restore respect for property rights, to limit taxes, to engage in deregulation. If you go back and look at the histories, they started here. This was the origins, right, of the, right, the anti-tax movement of the pro-property rights movement come from this county. And hey, they have become national movements. And I think it's finally reaching the Supreme Court. So uh, another set of cases in the property rights area, the court has even decided some of these nine to zero are trying to reinvigorate uh, the rights of property. You might have heard this year about the case of the 92 year old grandmother whose condo was seized by Minneapolis because she had fallen behind on her taxes. And she didn't contest that. She said, you can you know, take the condo and use it to pay my back taxes. What she didn't realize was that Minneapolis was going to take the rest of the condo too and kept the whole thing, paid off the taxes, and then added the rest of the money to the general, general revenue budget for Minneapolis. And the Supreme Court decided nine to zero that was a taking of property, and she had to get the, month, the surplus back. So th this is what I'm about. There's going to be, uh, I think, some new directions that the court conservatives have to decide upon now that we've won the abortion issue, now that we've won on uh, the right to bear arms, now that we've right, won on the idea of a colorblind constitution. And there's still going to be fights about those because it's going to be kind of like trench warfare. I mean, nobody really thinks that the thousands and thousands of Berkeley administrators are going to faithfully <laughs> adhere to the Harvard case or Prop 209. They're all trying to figure out ways to get around it. I don't know if you saw the story about all the universities that are asking about race in their college admission essay questions this year. So there's going to have to be a lot of follow-on litigation of the lower courts to enforce the Harvard case, to enforce uh, Dobbs, to enforce the right to bear arms, to enforce these property rights cases. But I think we also have the opportunity to have a discussion, think about where should the conservative uh, movement and conservative legal movement move next? What is most important? Uh, to preserving in our society when it comes especially to rights and the size of government. So uh, I don't want to uh, talk uh, too long. I don't actually want to tell you what's in the book so that you don't buy it. <laughs> so I'm just teasing you with what's, uh, what's in there. And then the, the last thing, uh, just and then I, I'd really love for Steve to come up and also to, to discuss all the issues that are going on in our country right now with the law is um, one thing, so some people accuse me of being excessively optimistic. <laughs> well, one reason I'm optimistic after looking at this last Supreme Court term and this one is it really is the triumph of conservative ideas. Because uh, when you read this, if you ever read any Supreme Court opinions about these big cases, what you'll see is that the conservative justices are really committed to the idea of originalism, which I think most Americans think is just common sense, which is, the Constitution's words mean what, the, what it meant when the people wrote that language and ratified it. It doesn't change over time based on what we, our whims, like property doesn't mean what we think property means today. Property means what the drafters of the Bill of Rights and the Reconstruction Amendments thought property meant when they wrote the word. 
And so you see a, a common conservative approach to the law amongst the six conservative justices. They don't all agree, but at least they have a common starting point. And the arguments are really focusing around what is the original meaning of the Constitution. When you read the liberal opinions, I feel so bad for them. <laughs> Not really. I don't really feel bad for them. They deserve it. No, but I feel they, they don't have a common ideology. They have lost their confidence, intellectual mm -hmm. confidence. Most of their opinions in these major cases are what we call results oriented. They're just arguing about, we don't like who wins and who loses in the case. They don't really have a ideological way of figuring out how do you interpret the constitution anymore in a principled way. And so you might have seen in the uh, Harvard case in the dissents, the Harvard case dissents were just about how bad the country is, how racist the country is. If the country is so racist and has been for so long, the argument was, well, how can you stop a little benefit like affirmative action? There was no effort to interpret what the meaning of the 14th Amendment's text was. It was just this, uh, I mean, we have a bunch of critical race theorists on the Supreme Court right now who are just attacking the majority for being racist. I've actually never really seen anything like this before, where it got that personal. That's why the Chief Justice's majority opinion gets a little bit personal, too. You might have seen he, he said, I would not take legal advice from the people who are in the dissent of a Supreme Court case. I mean, that's really personal for the Chief Justice of the United States to say in an opinion. But the reason why he was driven to that is because you have people in dissent who I hate to say it, they're a little bit like Marxists in the sense that they don't care about the reasoning, the principle, the text of the Constitution. What they care about is what social class wins and what social class loses from any decision. Whereas I think, what I, and having clerked for Thomas, I think I can say this, he doesn't care who wins or loses, what class wins, what class. He just wants to get the text right and let the distribution of consequences, right? That's, that's not up to the court. And if the American people want to change it, that's why we have election. And I think that's what gives me optimism, is that uh, I think uh, conservatives are really win winning the war of ideas, at least when it comes to the Constitution. And uh, I sense, actually, a, a, a lot of despair in, at the intellectual level from the left. Now Steve's going to come up and explain <laughs> why I'm totally optimist, too optimistic, <laughs> and that everything is falling all around us. But... Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me. I'd love to take your questions. Stay here. I, I guess we're going to do this Lincoln Douglas style, John, and share a mic. Uh, I'm going to let you in on a little trade secret. Uh, one of the things John and I do to disorient and get inside the heads of, and therefore mess with the thinking of liberal Berkeley law students, is we disagree in class a lot. It's actually very easy to do. John just made the admission against interest when he said he's come 50% of the way to Charles's opinion, which happens to be mine also. Now, I always see it as my job to get the other 50% of the way there. So I do. what I'm going to do here is talk about why his book is not nearly politically incorrect correct enough about the Supreme Court and its yeah. doctrines. But before doing that, I, there, there are two things you said. <laughs> you mentioned the EPA, John. You know what that means. <laughs> There's one prohibition in class. He won't let me mention the Clean Air Act. Yeah, because it puts everyone to sleep. Okay. Like I you're won't about, mention, no, you're no, about I won't, to do. No, I won't do that here. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I want to draw out a little bit more something quite important that you said about the Dobbs case and about the Harvard case. And let's go a little bit further explaining the deeper background of the constitutional principle involved. The Dobbs case and, and Roe, that was always about uh, the... the uh, promiscuous expansion of the due process clause, going back decades, used for all kinds of purposes. Uh, when the, a liberal judge wanted to find an outcome, well, due process clause, it, it, it covers everything. It was sort of a do whatever you want kind of clause. And Dobbs kind of called the end to that, I think. And then likewise, uh, the Harvard case, my summary would be, it got the 14th Amendment right for the first time practically since the 14th Amendment was written. I mean, there have been cases along the way that are maybe half right and so forth, but really since that amendment was passed in 1868, we've really had you know, 150 plus years of mostly wrong-headed jurisprudence on that. So my point is, I think those cases represent not just landmarks in their own terms on the issues involved, but major turning points in our jurisprudence. Is that too sweeping and broad? Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with Steve for once. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Mark that one down. But, but also observe that with Dobbs, the, the question of Dobbs is not whether 
abortion is a good policy or not, or when it should, the right should trigger or not, or whether it should be any right. All Dobbs did is say, it's up to you. The American people, you decide in elections. And right, it, some states might have a more liberal abortion policy now after Dobbs. We're finding out places like Kansas and Ohio, which have you know, returned you know, surprising election results about abortion. And some states might have more restrictive regimes after yeah. Dobbs um, than existed under Roe. But at least we all get to vote for it. We all get to elect people. It's not up to five justices of the Supreme Court. So it's also not just ending, I agree, this um, you know, sort of judicial uh, freelancing about the due process clause, but also is a, a decision that restores the Republican government we live under, where we get to make most of the decisions. Right. Uh, 14th Amendment, do you want to say more about that? Or you're happy with my summary that we're finally getting it right? <laughs> yeah. No, I, so I, I actually think um, this court has been pretty good about trying to end race, uh, the use of race by government. The problem has been that the, the uh, court also is very deferential to institutions that we all used to respect like schools and mm. university administrators. I mean, it's almost laughable to say that, but <laughs> you know, 20 years ago when Grutter is decided, which upheld the use of race, the court says, we don't know how to run universities. We're going to take the word of college professors and university administrators that racial diversity will lead to better education and better scholarship even. Yeah. And then it's really interesting. Chief Justice Roberts again says, really bluntly in this opinion, in the Harvard case, he says, we're not taking your word for it anymore. <clears throat> He says yeah. almost exactly like that. So that's part of it, too. Notice also uh, another group that the court took seriously and deferred to was the military. So you may not know this, but in the early affirmative action cases, the military was a very strong intervener in the cases saying, we need to use race when we run the military. you got to preserve affirmative action. And so that's probably the next fight is, I think the last little bit left of the court ending the use of race by government is by the military. Yeah, let me follow briefly on that point. Uh, the Supreme Court in general for a very long time has always been rather deferential to national security questions, I think. Uh, do you think that may make a difference when these cases come forward? Yeah, I don't think so. Because I, th I think uh, one thing, if you read the Harvard case, you get this sense that the court feels that all these experts pulled the wool over their eyes. Right. And so they're not. this is not a court that's in a mood to defer to anybody. So maybe that might be bad in the sense that the court also thinks it's supreme and the interpretation of the Constitution is not to be doubted. But on the other hand, I think it's fair that it's fair for them to think that a lot of the experts they've relied on have not been fully forthright with the court yeah. uh, and with the American people, perhaps. Um, and so one big area we're going to see, a lot, I think, a lot of activity is the court used to defer to the bureaucracy about where you know the right level of air pollution see now you can be happy <laughs> or the right level of water pollution or you know the sale of certain products and so on scientific questions um there's a case uh, up on the docket for this upcoming term where the court is going to reconsider that and decide whether to stop deferring to agencies which would be a really a more almost yeah. a mortal blow to the administrative state if courts were allowed to use their own judgment to ask right what's the proper um, whether lockdowns are a good idea mm. in response to a pandemic and say, let's look at the evidence ourselves. We don't have to defer to Dr. Fauci. We can make our own decision in the court about whether to, for example, you may remember this, allow churches in California to be open during a pandemic. Yeah, I mean, if casinos are going to be open, okay. Yeah. All right, let, let, me, uh, let me press you on why your book for is... A, for an Asian, having the casinos <laughs> open, far more important. <laughs> Uh, let me press you on why your book is not nearly politically incorrect enough. Uh, so you say on page one, quite rightly, Hamilton was wrong when he said the judiciary would be the least dangerous branch. Uh, but then on page 15, I'm not going to fly spec the whole thing that way, but on page 15, you mentioned that Marbury, the famous case in 1803, which established or solidified the principle of judicial review that the courts could strike down legislation by Congress, say that was the most important decision the court ever made. Um, my two-part question, why do we have a Supreme Court at all? Couldn't we have just uh, done it? We didn't have a, a national judiciary under the Articles of Confederation, and that wasn't one of the main complaints for the ineffectiveness of the Articles. Why couldn't we have followed something like the British practice, where interstate 
complaints and certain other national questions would be decided by a pool of nine senators drawn from the Senate. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that would make it somewhat more politically accountable the way the British judiciary is more politically accountable under the old doctrine of parliamentary supremacy. That was a mouthful. Yeah. I've got a yeah. follow-up on Marbury, so let you start with that one. Well, yeah, because things have turned out so well in Great Britain. <laughs> well, so the, the other model is, as Steve's described, and let me say, political scientists love the British system, right? Because it's so democratic, right? You just have pure democracy, one house, you have right majority of elections every now and then, and that 50.1% majority party runs everything. There's no judicial review, the courts can't stop them. There's no Senate that can really stop them. They've started to limit themselves by creating their own judicial review, but you know, under their system, they don't have an independent court system that can actually say, you are blocked. You, parliament, are blocked. Right? So what's happened in the last 100 years in British history? They've had socialism. They've had <laughs> Margaret Thatcher capitalism. Like, look at the wild swings that occur in a pure parliamentary <laughs> system. Uh, you know, they still have a monarchy. I mean, we got rid of that 225 <laughs> years ago, right? I mean, look at the... But the I mean, are, you, are you saying and it's our... every Every 50 years, we have to go save them from the Germans. I mean, this goes <laughs> on and on. <laughs> yeah, but John, I mean, are you really saying that our, our independent judiciary explains those significant no, no, but differences? Our, but our system is different in that it tamps down direct democracy. Okay. We're, we're a republic, not a democracy. Britain is as close as you come to more of a pure demo democratic system than ours. So judicial review, the Supreme Court's part of the Republican government that divides power. That's, so when I talked, when we talked to our European friends, Steve and I uh, went to Italy this last year to talk to friends of ours there. They, they don't get it, right? They don't get, why would you make it harder to exercise government power? Why would you have a separation of powers and federalism in such a powerful court? You're just stopping yourself from doing things, right? It's, you're stopping yourself. Why would you ever do that? Of course, now, and then I always say, well, Italy's had a good experience well, the last 100 years, too. But, but that's my point, is our system, one way to think of it is our system is a risk-averse system because we don't trust ourselves. Uh, we don't trust ourselves to be correct. We don't trust ourselves to be virtuous and moral. We might have terrible leaders. We might have, we would just make terrible decisions. And so our system really slows down the power of government. Uh, and the, the courts are part of that. So I think... Just based on your political science tools, I think judicial review is a good thing. Because that's how you guys would think about it. What are the consequences? I just think the Constitution requires it because there's three branches. They each have the right to interpret the Constitution when they do their job. And the Supreme Court decides cases. So they get, in many ways, the last word. And in our system, they have ultimately, I think Hamilton was wrong because I think in the end, they really have become the definer and protector of our individual liberties. Uh, they, they are the last ones there when the majority really is convinced they're right. When they really become convinced, for example, we got to stop these COVID disinformation people and we were going to take over social media and get them off the right. Right, The courts are the last line. I'm not saying courts are first and then courts should set policy, but they're the last ones to test everything we want to do against individual liberty. Yeah. That doesn't happen in Britain, right? They don't have actually a constitutional right of free speech in Britain. They prohibit hate speech, which we don't. They don't have a right to bear arms, right? They had a socialist government that took over all the main industries in the country. Right? Like think of all the liberties that don't exist in England. You're, I put political scientists in America, like Steve, <laughs> and even like Charles, they worship at the altar of Great Britain. They, they all they want to do is speak in British accents if they could. And I always watch a masterpiece theater on Sunday nights, these guys. I, I have refuted this cruel <laughs> calumny so many times. Like, I will say there was a reciprocal confusion on our side with our Italian friends because our thought was it would be good if your government could figure out how to do anything at all, but yeah. that's a separate problem. <laughs> Although, um, it's strangely, this is the first time in our lives, I think, where Italy has a more conservative government than the United States. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> how strange is that? It may last longer, too. We'll see. Yeah, uh, yeah but look, John, uh, look, look, when the courts are protecting individual rights correctly, they have not always done that evenly, but that's yeah. a long story. Uh, that's, then they're obviously operating correctly. On the other hand, the Supreme Court over the decades, and I would argue even starting as far back as Marshall, are responsible for eroding federalism, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, uh, permitting and encouraging the aggrandizement of executive power to the administrative state. Mm -hmm. And you know all the landmarks. I don't need to recite them for you. Uh, and that goes back a very long time. And so, uh, ah, that leads to question number two, which is Marbury. 
So as we know, Marbury was the first time the court struck down an act of Congress. Of course, it was an act of was Judiciary Act of 1789, just to geek out for a minute. Section 13, uh, expanding the court's jurisdiction. The court said, you can't tell the judiciary uh, jurisdiction that's limited in the Constitution. So it was a bill affecting another branch. Okay, nothing happens for another four, 50 years till we get the second time the Supreme Court strikes down an act of Congress. Are we happy about that one? Dred Scott he's referring to. That was the second time. <laughs> Dred Scott was the only the second time the court struck down an act of Congress. Are we? Okay, you see where this is going. So actually, I think um, Steve is correct when he says, you know, the courts have blessed some terrible things. Right? They bless slavery and Dred Scott. They bless segregation in Plessy versus Ferguson. They did bless the great expansion of the administrative state under FDR. Initially, they tried to stop him, but they got overwhelmed. Uh, I don't think of these as cases where the court was uh, where the court was engaged in helping the other branches of government to sort of undermine the basic separation of powers and federalism principles that protect our system. I think they just failed. They didn't have courage at the end. So they were the last people who were trying to stop all of these things from happening. And if they had had more judicial courage, in a way, they could have at least tried to stop right, the coming of the Civil War instead of contributing to it. They could have tried to stop Jim Crow segregation in the South. Instead, they, the, what failed was that they just kind of went along with the majority or what they thought was the majority. That was their mistake. And I think that got worse in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, where they thought, take um, uh, gay marriage. Again, like Dobbs, the gay marriage cases are not about whether you think gay marriage is a good idea or not, but it was just about letting the democracy decide whether to have gay marriage. Sometimes I think the court thinks it's like slightly leading the majority in the sort of enlightened direction it should be led in. Uh, in a way, uh, which I think is that's when they get into a lot of trouble. And it's very interesting. (laughs) Justice Ginsburg gave a speech before she was on the Supreme Court where she actually thought, you know, if if Roe had never been decided and politics had just been left to go on, might have had more, uh, a more liberal abortion regime in the country than the one we eventually had under Roe. And she said it, it would have been politically legitimate. People would have accepted it because they voted for it. And she said, The court kind of trying to be just in front of public opinion actually might cause us to have more division and controversy. So that's when I think the court gets in trouble. I would like them to have more judicial fortitude saying to the majority, slow down and stop, right? Right? Uh, Consider the individual liberty uh, effects of what you're doing, like they should have done in Plessy versus Ferguson. So, oh, sorry. But when they start to try to lead majorities, I think that's when they really have the problems you're talking. So in other words, we should have an amendment that says, under no circumstances shall there be a Justice George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel. <laughs> okay. okay. That went over your own head. <laughs> a lot of talk of reform. You mentioned that Democrats want to pack the court again. They tried that in 1937. Uh, but other ideas have been proposed. I'll mention three. One is term limits. Should, be, should, you, should there be term limits for justices, 18 years or something? Second... A hundred years ago, Teddy Roosevelt proposed some kind of popular referendum on Supreme Court decisions. Mm-hmm. What about, I mean, shouldn't there perhaps be, say, a two-thirds or three-quarters majority vote like the veto override option? Do we want to have that? And third, my favorite is, should we impeach judges more often for things other than tax evasion? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, blatantly disregarding their judicial oath to defend the Constitution. So my general instinct, maybe this is why I'm conservative, is not to tinker with the Constitution. So I would just leave it alone unless it's obviously broken. In fact, many times we fix things in the Constitution that I didn't think were actually broken. Like, we really should not let 18-year-olds vote. Ah. (laughs) I mean, I would be in favor of restoring it back to 21. So Vivek Ramaswamy is your candidate. I'd make it 30 if I could. (laughs) Actually, maybe just 75 would be fine with me. I'm not convinced that making you younger, giving you younger, lowering the age of vote, lower and lower is a good thing. But um, I find this actually a very, see, this is, again, Steve is falling, uh, is, has been ensnared I'm by just the liberal academia. <laughs> because um, I find this actually a recurring, historically recurring theme of progressives on the left. Because you think about it, um, progressives always think they have some 
ultimate goal they're trying to achieve. Right now, it seems to be like global warming mm. and racial diversity. And they're so important. Anything that stops you from achieving that goal has to be swept aside or changed. And what's going to do that? Institutions, right? The institutions of American government, and the Constitution, are designed to slow down our decision making, to make sure we don't make mistakes. It's a risk averse Constitution. And so progressives, they can't stand anything, particularly the courts, that cause them to slow down or even stop. So usually it's progressives. And Teddy Roosevelt was a terrible progressive this, in his second term, maybe even his first, not right. second term, his second effort at the presidency. Um, but Woodrow Wilson loved these ideas too, because it's always, I think, progressives who want to push aside the institutions I think have served us extremely well, uh, like judicial review, like making it hard to impeach judges, like not allowing Congress to overturn the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution. So I would say just leave all these. Now, the, the one thing about term limits is interesting, but I would say I think the obvious need for term limits is greater in the other branches of government right now. <laughs> so if maybe we have a constitutional amendment that would set a term limit and maximum age for all three branches simultaneously, ah. that I think would really help the country. I have seen some justices who were very old serving on the court in their 80s or above. Um, when I clerked, Justice Stevens was on the court and he, you know, he was, well, I think he retired around 90. I think he broke the record for the oldest serving justice. I think he broke Holmes's record or was close yeah. to it. But I'd rather have an age maximum for president right now or an age maximum for members of Congress right now than uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, but I, I would be in favor of one that applies to all three branches simultaneously. Okay, so two more quick questions about things that are in the news, and then we do have some time for audience questions. Uh, you, you mentioned the climate business. I was going to ask you about a case out of Montana in just the last 48 oh, hours. Yeah. It's a state case. And Montana, in their new constitution, which I think dates all the way back to 1972 or 78, so it's pretty modern, it has a clause saying that something like, Montana citizens have a right to a clean and healthy and safe environment. Meaning what? Well, a judge says, meaning people have standing to sue for relief from a judge to solve the problem of global warming. Go. Well, we also <laughs> had a case like that in Oakland and San Francisco, yeah. where Oakland and San Francisco have sued all the oil companies, right. uh, which may explain why Chevron's moving <laughs> to right. Texas soon. Um, but they sued them for global warming and said a similar theory. Uh, the, global, the global warming is being produced by these oil companies, and they're raising... Uh, the water levels in the bay, and so we're going. We seek billions of dollars in the costs that are going to be necessary to, you know, build levees and you know shore up foundations. Although at the same time, I'm very curious about this with Montana too. They were selling bonds on the public market, yes, I was hoping saying bring that up. there will be no cost to from global warming to the city, and so you can lend, you can borrow, you, you we can borrow money at very low rates. Don't worry about how we're going to spend the money. They've actually probably violated federal securities laws yeah. if they've been floating bonds that say one thing and are filing lawsuits to say another thing. I'm very curious whether yeah. Montana has been actually borrowing in the public market saying, we don't think there's really many costs to worry about with uh, global warming, which I bet they have been saying a lot of cities and states do. But I think the, but the, the, the more uh, deeper point is this shows a difference, I think, between progressive theories of rights and I think the founders and American theories of rights, which is, I, I think progressive thinks, think rights are things you can demand from the government. Like I want a right to an education, so I'm gonna sue the government until it gives me the education or the environment. And the rights that our constitution has, which are you know, from the 18th century really, and our courts uh, really are better designed to enforce our negative rights. They're just saying, leave me alone rights. They're just saying, government stop taking away my right to speak, stop interfering my religious exercise, stop trying to take away my guns. They're not right giving you, they're not forcing the government to give you anything. They're just negative rights designed to protect you from the government. And so I think ultimately that theory of rights is going to be rejected, although it might just be under state law. And then if Montana wants to yeah. screw things up, they can. And then all the oil companies can stop doing business in Montana yeah. and see how that goes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, all right. Last question for me for now. I have a whole lot of a lot of weak points in your book. I could beat you up on for hours, but I won't. <laughs> All right, let's open it up to uh, audience questions. I see the first one right back there, and then I'll get you over there. Uh, so I work in like K through twelve public education advocacy. I get 
tell you the idea of critical thinking, huh. the idea of free speech is dead in our K through twelve schools. Is there any hope for you, university and law school people, of helping our students and our next generation of lawyers understand the value of diverse views and critical thinking skills and, uh, and free speech? It, it, oh boy, think more about that's this. a well, that's a tough one. Um, I have this great experience at Berkeley. I, I get asked, I don't know if you get it, I get asked to come to the alumni weekends in the fall and be on a panel, and it's like, you know, 40th, 50th anniversary. So it's old hippies from the 60s and 70s, and, you know, they got ponytails and beards, and they sort of look like, they, you know, they're still haven't really aged out of hippiedom. But they all say the same thing. What is wrong with the students these days on free speech? We were for free speech, and we meant it, by golly. What's so, you know, that kind of gives me a little bit of hope. I don't know. Um, I, I do occasionally, actually more than occasionally, I experience myself quite a few undergraduate progressive students who, by the way, I, I, I took Harvey Mansfield's advice. I advertise myself as a conspicuous conservative. First thing I tell a class the first day is I'm a card-carrying member of the vast right-wing conspiracy, and I flash a picture up on the screen of me and George W. Bush and George Will, another, you know, okay. So, and then I say, the next thing to say is, if you're progressively oriented, like so many Berkeley students are, you're going to be rewarded in this class for disagreeing with me. And that's going to make it a great class. And they're shocked. And all of these progressive students come talk to me one at a time and say, oh, yeah, I'm really, I, you know, I don't think I'll agree with anything you have to say, but I'm really tired of the conformity of the campus. Now, I do hear from other, they often tell me, by the way, I've told my friends about you and they won't go near you because, well, he's a right-wing extremist. Why would I do that? So there is that problem. It's very deep. It's very bad. But there are at least a few who are, you know, not so brain dead that they won't actually question their own dogmas. They just lack the courage to speak out openly about it. And that's a big problem. Peer pressure is worse than faculty pressure, really, I think, at the college level. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, that's what I want to uh, say. Although. I'm stunned how nice the students are to you. How did this happen? They're not <laughs> Nowhere near as nice you, to me. You came to class one day. They were perfectly charming. So uh, I, I think the interesting problem is we used to worry about liberal professors sort of indoctrinating students. Um, that is not the problem anymore. The problem is that the, the cancel culture is generated by the students. They are uh, yeah. so worried about being attacked, not in person and face to face, on social media that they, want, they, they don't want to have uncomfortable speech. They don't want to say controversial things. They don't want to hear speakers who make them uncomfortable. This, this is really not being, in fact, the worst people, uh, the, the people who are in so many ways the worst position of all this are, I think, liberal faculty members, because they are definitely afraid of being called a racist by a student. I've been called racist so many times by students. I'm kind of inoculated, <laughs> but they are so. So you you have the almost the students and their sensitivities are what are generating this climate of suppression of free speech and debate. It's really it's not official policy, university policies that are causing it. I don't, I don't think. Yeah. I, so it's your fault because your kids are coming to us this way. Although, <laughs> although I will add, uh, I'm curious what Heather thinks about this. Uh, my perception is that private liberal arts colleges are actually much worse places than Berkeley or yeah. Michigan or you know state big state universities. Not that they're not that we're great, but you know Sarah Lawrence or a place like that, they're really awful. Um, I, anyway, I'll talk to you about that. Uh, gentlemen back there, I saw next, and then I'll get to you guys. Question. Since we have three nominally independent branches of government, wherein lies the power for Congress to set the ethics standards for another branch of oh. government? And kind of a corollary, how does that relate to the Presidential Records Act? Oh. So as, as uh, you may know, Justice Salito has uh, said quite strongly that Congress doesn't have that power to set ethics. Um, I tend to agree with them that uh, the Congress can't force this ethics bill on the Supreme Court. I think what will probably happen is that the Supreme Court will adopt one on its own in order to forestall any kind of congressional passage. Um, but it is an interesting constitutional question because uh, you know, all the Constitution says is there has to be a chief justice. It doesn't say anything else about how many justices, what the generally what the powers of the court are. Uh, and so we've usually um, said it's up to the Congress 
how many justices, how the court system's organized. On the other hand, we've always thought that Congress couldn't tell the courts how to decide cases. So just for example, Steve mentioned the progressives uh, like Roosevelt and uh, Woodrow Wilson, they toyed around with the idea of saying you can't overturn a, a, con a congressional act unless you have a two thirds majority on the Supreme Court. I think that would have been unconstitutional because it's telling the courts how they are allowed to decide a case or controversy. So the ethics law is interesting because you could say, oh, well, maybe it's part of the organization of the courts, but it's clearly being done in order to change how the Supreme Court decides cases. And that's the line Congress can't cross. So with the Presidential Records Act, um, you know, uh, this is all Nixon's fault. <laughs> so, as, mo as most <laughs> things are. No, yeah. because he... You know, there's, you know, there's actually one rule at the Supreme Court is that if your name is Nixon, you're going to lose. It doesn't have to be Richard Nixon. There are lots of Nixons. They always tend to lose at the Supreme Court. <laughs> but after Watergate, there were a lot of changes in, you know, law made. And until Nixon, presidents did own all the papers as it was considered their personal property. And so it was only after Watergate that the Congress actually took presidential papers and said, no, we're going to keep them and we're going to put them in archives. And actually Nixon, is even Nixon sued and said, that's a taking of my personal property. I want, you know, I want just compensation then. And so the Supreme Court, and this was a very typical of the Supreme Court in the 1970s, just said, uh, we're going to balance everything, which means that Nixon loses. <laughs> and so Nixon lost that case. I bet it would come out maybe differently if it were redone now. But because of that, under the Presidential Records Act, which was upheld, presidential papers are considered the property of the United States. And so uh, presidents lost that, that personal property. It's very interesting though, if you go to uh, presidential libraries that existed before this, they were all, they're, they're, you can only see them because the, pers the president, when he passed away, yeah. opened them up to the public. And there's still some papers we're not allowed to see. I think a lot of Kennedy papers are still closed yeah. too. <laughs> for good reason. Yeah. yeah. But my question for you, John, is, with regard to the, the packing of the U.S. Supreme Court, I'm not sure how this ever really gets much traction. I know there were some congressional acts previously with regard to the number, but we know now that Congress is interested in packing the court because they don't like the decisions. Yeah. Article 3 allows for the establishment, broad discretion for the establishment of courts, but not with the tinkering of courts because they don't like the decisions that are coming out of the court. Mm -hmm. So couldn't the court say, look, based on the context, of this legislation where we know it's because you're going after us because you don't like our decisions. Now it violates the separation of powers, that's one. So they couldn't they strike down that legislation for that reason, and then two, isn't it the Chief Justice that swears in the, the nominees anyway? Couldn't you simply refuse to swear in the nominees? The new ones. If, so it just seems like there's a separation of powers issue here. I know there's precedent in the past, but again, the context means everything when it comes to intent of legislation. And if, Biden's out there saying, I'm going to pack the court because I don't like the outcome. It seems like that's a separation of powers issue. Yeah. So I just, I don't know, I just wanted, I don't know so why just, it's getting so much traction. So just a historical point, uh, the number nine uh, has really been the one we've had since uh, 1869. Right. So it has fluctuated. It's been as slow as five and as high as 10. I don't know why anyone would have an even number for justices, but there was a, there have been a short time where there have been, like there was six uh, for a little bit. Um, but after 1869, we did have this kind of um, consensus in the country not to do exactly what you're saying, not to change the numbers of the court to affect its decisions because it becomes a, a race to the bottom because once one side does it, the other side will do it, and then where will it end? So I, I, I quite agree with you. I, I can't see the court, though, being the one that's going to say, oh, the president and Congress have passed a law adding new members and the other justice saying, we're just going to not recognize them as a way of striking the law down. I'd never actually heard of uh, that proposal before. Even when FDR said he was going to add six justices to the Supreme Court, even the Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes admitted that they could do that if they wanted to. And FDR was open. He said, I'm doing this because they've struck down the New Deal. And now what happened is what, I don't think this would happen now, but what could happen is it may, may not know, the Supreme Court changed its mind about the New Deal and ended up upholding the entire New Deal at the same time that FDR agreed to drop. Oh, he didn't agree, but FDR basically gave up on patent. Well, yeah. Yeah. In characterizing the dissents in the recent 
affirmative action case. Because I think Sotomayor was involved in statutory interpretation of what was the intent of the 14th Amendment. Were we really intending to be colorblind? Or in her conceit, were we saying that it's OK to have legislation that helps blacks? So that was the issue. And I don't think it was purely, this is a racist country. So there was some patina. I was taken away by Justice Jackson's dissent, which is that. But my main point is, how do we walk back from the abyss? The legitimacy of our government and the great Anglo-American tradition rests on the belief that we have recourse to a neutral arbiter, whether it's the great tradition of habeas corpus or any other type of case that may come before a court. And now, we're all legal realists. The legal realists of the early 20th century said that judges are inevitably influenced by their politics. And now, our discourse about Supreme Court appointments and everybody else is overtly political. And we all believe that it matters. This is with the Trump thing. Well, it matters that he's now got a conservative judge in Florida, but every place else, it's a liberal. This is very corrosive. If we really do, are that unblinkered about the alleged impossibility of impartiality to think that it depends, the outcome of a case depends on the politics of the judge. And that is a discussion with Supreme Court appointments all the time. Is there any way to walk that back? Or do we just have to live with that tension? I will say, I think that conservatives on the court used to try to address this, Justice Scalia in particular, by employing originalism and reaching a liberal outcome that they did not like. And then saying, see, I'm being honest to the principle. So I'll point out two. One is Justice Scalia was very much in favor of limiting new technologies with the Fourth Amendment. So Justice Scalia, who was very open that he think the police should get more freedom and that we've limited them too far with the Bill of Rights and so on. But he was the first guy who said, using drones or GPS trackers or tracking your cell phone, that's all unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment unless you get a warrant. And so he would say, see, I'm a principled original. The other area he did that was religious liberty, this case called Smith, where he said, when there's a general criminal law, for example, that prohibits the smoking of hallucinogenics, if that actually happens to ban a ceremony and a religion, the courts aren't going to protect you. You should get the legislature to give you an exception. These are both decisions a lot of conservatives do not like. But I used to think that was part of what the courts conservatives were doing. We're trying to show it's not about the political bottom line for us. We're more interested in following principle. And the disappointing thing is I don't think that worked in the sense that I can't think of cases by the liberal justices where they say, I'm following my own liberal ideology or method, and I reach conservative results. See, I can show that there's a difference between law and politics. You could almost see like the conservatives on the court made an overture to try to show that they were willing to recognize this distinction. And I don't think the liberal justices or liberal, I don't think the liberal intellectual project or scholarship grabbed that hand offered in compromise. So the question then is if one side is, I mean, if one side, and we're liberals, I think, I mean, critical theory, this is what they believe. Politics is really everything. And there is no such thing as independent law. If they really believe that, then what's the proper response? I mean, one side, I think you see this in sort of younger, new right people is we should just use the same tactics as them. And we should just care about results too now and not pledge to an ideology. I think Heather is asking a broader question than that. But we're short of time. And I want to get in the last question here. And we'll go in overtime maybe. Thank you, John. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Alex. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.